1932 marked a new frontier in our nation's history. The final triumph over poverty that President Hoover once promised America fell on deaf ears as the Great Depression plunged the nation into turmoil. So in November of that year, the American people elected Franklin D. Roosevelt to reorient the role of government by invoking the constitutional promise to promote the general welfare. But he didn't do it alone. Roosevelt made history by nominating the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet, Frances Perkins. If you look at those pictures, it's 20 guys and one woman. And there, was never, there were never two women with authority in those rooms. And Perkins used that power for good, fighting for the forgotten workers of America, whose jobs had become dangerous during the nation's rapid industrialization. Frances Perkins really was the motivating force behind most of the social safety net rules that we have today. Social security for when you retire, so you have security as you age. Unemployment insurance, it gives you some kind of support until you can go back to work, really critical. As Secretary of Labor, Perkins would blaze new frontiers, challenging gender norms and weaving a social safety net which still impacts how millions of Americans live their lives to this day. For centuries, women in America were denied access to formal education and political participation. That changed when women such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony paved the way for women's suffrage, leading to the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, giving women the right to vote. Yet despite wielding the power of the ballot, women still faced many challenges. Many Americans still believed that women's place was in the home. Women who spoke out or advocated for their rights were often met with ridicule, criticism, and even violence from the men in charge. But during this time, it was not only women who were engrossed in a struggle for their rights. America's rapid industrialization during the Gilded Age drove workers from farms to factories, mines, and other hard labor, where they faced harsh working conditions, long hours, and low pay. As the Progressive Era began, society sought to fix the abuses of the rise of industry. Reformers such as Florence Kelly and Jane Addams would pioneer urban and labor reforms, creating the National Consumer League. These women inspired Frances Perkins to move to New York in 1910 as a social worker. There, one tragic coincidence would lead to her becoming a key figure in the fight for workers' rights. The accident happened on a, on a Saturday. Uh, I happened to have been visiting a friend in the park, on the other side of the park, and we heard the engines and we heard the screams and rushed out and rushed over where we could see that the trouble was. In New York City, she witnessed as the flames engulfed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Faulty fire escapes and locked doors trapped workers as the scorching flames grew. One by one, desperate women jumped to their deaths from the upper floors of the factory. 146 workers died that day. These workers were often young immigrant girls. Some were as young as 14. The tragedy would influence Perkins for the rest of her life. Perkins left her position at the New York office of the National Consumers League and on the recommendation of Theodore Roosevelt, became the executive secretary for the Committee on Safety of the City of New York, formed to improve fire safety. In 1919, Perkins was added to the Industrial Commission of the State of New York by Governor Al Smith becoming one of the first female commissioners in New York. Her nomination was met with protests from both manufacturers and labor, neither of whom felt Perkins represented their interests, and state senators pointed to Perkins not taking her husband's name as a sign that she was a radical. However, six months into her job, her fellow commissioner, James M. Lynch, called Perkins' contributions invaluable, 
saying, "From the work which Miss Perkins has accomplished, I am convinced that more women ought to be placed in high positions throughout the State Department." Her commitment to social justice and experience in labor and politics led newly elected New York Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt to appoint Perkins as an inaugural New York State Industrial Commissioner in 1929, where she put New York in the forefront of progressive reform. She expanded factory investigations, reduced the work week for women to 48 hours, and championed the minimum wage and unemployment insurance laws. When Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president in 1932, he asked Perkins to join his cabinet as Secretary of Labor. To Roosevelt, she listed her demands: a 40-hour work week, a minimum wage, workers and unemployment compensation, a federal law banning child labor, aid for the unemployed, social security, and health insurance. She proposed a fundamental restructuring of American society. Roosevelt said he would back her. The next day, she called Roosevelt and accepted the offer. By accepting a position in Roosevelt's cabinet, Frances Perkins would change the course of women's history in America, pioneering a new frontier of possibility. As secretary, Perkins oversaw the Department of Labor during the Great Depression, inheriting the worst economic crisis in America's history. Perkins' job was not easy. She was the first female cabinet secretary in a time when many people believed that women were simply not suited for public office. She would have to prove her worth to the public. And she was constantly attacked. Was one journalist calling her the first woman to be a president's henchman? Newspapers would print descriptions they would never call male government officials, discussing her powder puff and lipstick, and how she slept in a twin bed and an old-fashioned nightgown. The biggest controversy was that Perkins went by her maiden name. She is really Mrs. Paul Wilson, but she uses her maiden name in public life. The Oakland Tribune scolded, but despite all the opposition thrown at her, she proved herself a pioneer. I have spent most of my adult life in the service of the people of my country, working to improve their living and laboring standards. I have done what I could in my time to make this great country of ours a little nearer to our conception of the city of God. Throughout her 12-year tenure, she worked diligently to give a voice to the forgotten workers of America. As chair of the President's Committee on Economic Security, she was involved in all aspects of its advisory reports, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the CCC camps. She was responsible for many of the key provisions of the New Deal, including the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Her most important contribution would be to design the Social Security Act. It was a model that a lot of people didn't support, so there was a tremendous amount of pushback. She was very fortunate that FDR really had such a strong hold of the politics of the country, and the country was in dire straits. Perkins was a force behind so many pillars of his program to combat the Great Depression that some called the Perkins New Deal. Her commitment to protecting the working class and empowering women was instrumental in alleviating the effects of the Great Depression. From minimum wage laws to federal regulations on child labor and worker safety, the impact of her work lives on today. The impact of Social Security alone has been enormous. It reduced poverty among the elderly, provided a reliable source of income for disabled workers and their families, and supported millions of workers who had lost their jobs. In the Great Depression, there was nothing. People lost their entire life savings. They lost their homes. They were left without anything, and there were no, there was nothing to support them. So, Social Security, unemployment insurance, wage and hour laws, all of that helped lift people up. And give them a security they needed until the economic engine could begin moving again, and people could go back to work. But Frances Perkins leaves behind an even greater legacy. She helped pave the way for women to enter the male-dominated political world. 
more than 30 women have held cabinet positions since Frances Perkins first accepted Franklin Roosevelt's offer to become Secretary of Labor. Today, it would be easy to assume that Frances Perkins was little more than a novelty appointment in Franklin Roosevelt's presidential cabinet, who served her time, accomplished little, and then disappeared from the national arena. She does not appear in historical accounts of the 1930s, nor does she appear in introductory textbooks beyond being the first woman to serve in a president's cabinet. Even those who worked for Perkins during the Great Depression minimize her role in Washington in their biographies and memoirs. Perkins was a pioneering leader, an unsung hero for the ordinary people of America. There is almost no writing about her in public administration despite her enduring impact. 2020 was the 140th anniversary of Perkins' birth. Just as the Great Depression exposed the costs of the growing wealth inequality of the Gilded Age, so the pandemic exposed the yawning inequities in our economy, inequities that we must fix. We have an alarming number of people who work minimum wage jobs. Only more than 50% are women. Many of those women are single mothers. People lost a lot and we were very afraid and we didn't know what was going on, but most of us had some kind of cushion. And people who were unemployed, for the most part, were able to get unemployment insurance. Frances Perkins broke gender barriers and gave America a safety net, which would fundamentally change it for good. By building upon Perkins' pioneering accomplishments, we can forge a better path forward.